We are live. I do see participants joining in. We are just waiting a couple of, of moments before we officially welcome everybody and, and starting our nice evening discussion. I don't know about our guests, but I do feel that perhaps I just simply start because people will be kind of slowly joining in. And as we have not really an overview, how many we need to expect. So it would be a bit of an artificial waiting. I'm, and it's great that we are all here and our speakers are here. And um, it's super nice to not seeing our guests, but at least, or like the attendees, but at least I do see numbers which are constantly increasing. So I take over the, the Zoom floor. And I would like to say good evening, everybody. It's, um, it's super great having you all with us. So my name is Pia Fricka and together with Konstantinos Miliadis, um, I will be moderating this kind of great event. So Konstantinos was waving. I think you kind of saw him amongst our, our guests and, and speakers. On behalf of the whole Alto Laser Talks community, I warmly welcome you all to our second Laser Talk event here at Alto University, obviously virtual. And even so, being again in Zoom, I'm pretty sure that we will be having a wonderful evening with inspiring talks and interesting discussions. And before we dive into the specific theme of the evening and the introduction of our guests and participating colleagues, I would firstly like to hand over to Xenia Caverina, who will be explaining, especially to our attendees, the practicalities of this event. So Xenia, please take over. Thank you, Pia. And hello, everybody from my part as well. So just some words on our Zoom etiquette today, tonight. Um, as you see, the event is being live streamed and recorded. Um, you don't have, I mean, the participants uh, don't have a video or audio option, but uh, everyone apart from the speakers uh, will have their video also off during presentations. Uh, please use the chat to communicate with uh, others and with us. We'll do our best to notice the messages in time and respond. If you want to um, ask a question, uh, you want, you want to use the Q&A section. That is uh, one button on the panel. And uh, the moderator and panelists will be taking questions after presentations. In case something goes wrong or the connection breaks, we will do our best to fix it as soon as possible. And we would like you to participate actively, but we also remind that this talk is a safe space free from any kind of discrimination or harassment. And the chat as well as the Facebook comments will be moderated. And we hope that you feel comfortable and enjoy this evening. I will also post a link to the chat where you can register already for the next uh, laser talk updates and uh, updates from laser community at Alto. And we will be soon uh, sharing the news about the next laser talk. So enjoy. Great. Thank you very much, Xenia, and we will keep on reminding you to use the Q&A, so, so don't worry, you can also lean back and, and just relax for the first part of the session. So firstly, I would like to introduce the concept of, of Laser Talks to you generally. So Leonardo Laser Talks are a program of international gatherings that brings artists, scientists, humanists, and technologists together for informal presentation performances and conversations with the wider public. The mission of laser is truly to encourage contribution to, 
the cultural environment of a region by fostering interdisciplinary dialogue and opportunities for community building currently to over 40 cities worldwide. And Alto University has joined Leonardo Laser Talks at the end of last year, which was a bottom-up cross-disciplinary disciplinary initiative driven by my dear colleagues, whom I will introduce to you in a second. And our motivation is to build up a community beyond Alto University in order to get into exchange on regional and local level. And of course, as we have experienced through the pandemics, these terms get a new kind of reading and understanding. But nevertheless, I can, from my personal point of view, already say that we are looking very much forward to hopefully be able to host the next Laser Talks event in autumn physically here at Alto University. And you are already very much welcome to join. So for this first year, our planned three to four Laser Talks focus on the general term adaptation, setting a specific focus to each of the events. And the previous event in January discussed adaptation and bodies in context. And tonight we will focus on the theme adaptation and space. So this laser talk will intersect different practices and discourses as heterogeneous but complementary articulations of space that address, operate on and contribute in different ways and capacities to the transformation of the contemporary environment and its challenges, which we see in the social, the infrastructural, the technological, the sensory, the virtual, the build and the unbuilt. And the unbuilt. So these will be addressed and discussed from different viewpoints tonight. And next to our amazing guests, you do see here on the Zoom screen our Alto Laser team, which I will shortly like to introduce. So you have a better understanding maybe later on when we go into the discussion of their backgrounds. And I'll do start with Laura Bellhoff, as she's the key person introducing the Laser Talks format to Alto. So Laura Bellhoff is Professor of Visual Culture and Artistic Practices at the Department of Art in the School of Arts, Design and Architecture. And I follow with um, follow up by Korai Tahirokli, an Academy Research Fellow in the Department of Media at the School of Arts, Design and Architecture as well. And you already have heard and saw Xenia Caverina, a doctoral candidate in the School of Arts, Design and Architecture. And then I continue with Kirsi Peltonen, um, a senior university lecturer in the Department of Mathematics and System Analysis in the School of Science. We have another colleague of ours who will join in shortly, at least I don't see him yet. Um, Nitin Shone, a professor of practice in the Department of Computer Science. And we have Konstantinos uh, Miliatis, a research fellow at the Department of Design and Department of Architecture, also in the School of Arts, Design and Architecture, as well as myself. And I'm a professor of practice in the field of computational methodologies in landscape architecture and urbanism at the Department of Architecture, also in the School of Arts, Design and Architecture. All right, so you see we are kind of a diverse, um, a diverse range of people who, who share certain interest in exchanging certain kind of themes, but also um, understand that we need to kind of go into discourse and, and broaden up our own way of thinking in order to hopefully formulate kind of um, solutions or challenges or answers to the challenges we are facing. And that's why we were super happy to actually get all the guests we wanted to have for this session. So everyone will, whom we felt like would be important also agreed on joining in. And um, I'm giving a very warm welcome to our guests and we are very honored and happy that you could all make it. And I have to share with the audience that we had already very interesting Zoom meetings. And I was looking so much forward to finally hear more about your amazing work and viewpoints on the theme adaptation and space. And we have organized this evening in a way that each guest has around 10 minutes to share with us a teaser of his or her work in relation to the overall theme so that we can afterwards firstly have a panel discussion to be later enriched through your questions and comments. So therefore, as Xenia was saying, we do ask everybody in the audience to either make a note of your questions or simply write them directly into the chat so we can integrate your viewpoints in the discussion. All right, so we're getting closer to 
to the more interesting parts. So what I will do right now, I will very shortly introduce um, all our guests to you and I will go in the same order as they will also then continue with their, with their talks. So I'll start with um, Konstantinos Miliadis, who is a transdisciplinary architect, also a programmer, media artist, a researcher, and a teacher. And he has his main focus on real-time interactive virtual augmented reality design for the purpose of incorporating the spatio-temporal dimensions of contemporary media to expand the scope of architecture. And you will hear very soon that Konstantinos, he tasks himself with exploring various qualitative dimensions of the concept of space in his talk. And don't get confused. So Konstantinos is having a double role tonight. So he is on one hand a speaker, but on the other hand, he will also join in as a co-moderator in the event, which I'm very happy and thankful for. And then I continue with welcoming Shubang Singh, a visual artist and filmmaker, and Chubangi's practice responds to contemporary politics and the interconnectedness of production and reproduction of popular everyday material. She works across the media ranging from text to moving image and site-specific installations. And her practice often draws up on empirical as well as existing and recorded knowledge to address movement, identity, bodily autonomy, and queries related to gendered body and its relationship with public sphere. And Shubangi is going to speak on how, as artists and creative practitioners, we can raise critical questions about places where we live in that influence us and are affected by our contact with them. After Shubangi, we um, welcome Friederike Landau as the, as the third speaker. So Friederike is an assistant professor of cultural geography in the uh, Radboud University in the Netherlands. And I make a disclaimer, I'm, I'm horrible with pronunciation names and places and whatever. So I use my creative freedom to do it in my way and you can correct me. And Friederike is a political theorist an urban sociologist and cultural geographer interested in spatial and political theories of conflict and art led activism and politics of public art and the many forms, shapes and movements of the political. Friederike's talk will address practices of infrastructuring as political tools to adapt within ongoing systemic and pandemic induced crisis of precarity. And then finally, as um, we welcome Oz Genjoluglu, and you need to say it again, a co-founder and head of AI at Top Data Science, a Helsinki-based AI consultancy. And Oz is an expert in machine learning and deep learning and artificial intelligence. And with his team, he delivered more than 70 machine learning solutions in numerous industries for the past five years. And before that, he had used to conduct machine learning research in several countries and has given a huge number of international talks and lectures. And we are very happy that in his presentation, he will talk about trade-offs we inevitably make while reclaiming or letting go of space and whether algorithmic decision-making and use of artificial intelligence can have impact on this. So by having said that, and uh, you will probably remember while the speakers have their minutes to share with us um, their thoughts on it, I actually, hand over to our first speaker, Konstantinos, and don't get kind of um, irritated. We have agreed that we will all turn off our cameras and, and of course mute ourselves so you can focus actually on the speaker and we will come back after the series of talks. So Konstantinos, the Zoom floor is yours. Hello and thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Now you should be able to see my screen. Right? Perfect, yes. Okay, so let me begin. In the next 10, 13 or so minutes, I want to elaborate on certain complications that arise from the complexity of notions of space that all of us uh, here uh, use in different, in different ways and through different disciplines um, addressing this, this thing. So let me start by saying that space is the place. Space is the, where things happen. Space is what we can inhabit. Space is what we can follow. 
I'm here both, both as a moderator as well as a speaker. Therefore, I assume that my role is to open up the space for the talks and discussions to follow in which to think together and try to learn together. That becomes already a bit of a paradox since the circumstances dictate that we shall not be in the same physical space. Therefore, we come to meet through the virtual dimension. Our meeting is real, just the materiality of space is quite strange. We don't really share space in a traditional sense, but we are here in multiple uh, places, sharing together a peculiar patch of space and time. We are in the Zoom, as a friend of mine sent me a few days ago, which as a space come, comes with its own conditions, its own, its own architecture of rooms and its own governance. And while seemingly intangible, this space runs on what we call servers, uh, that are actual physical things in actual physical locations, and certainly not without footprint. For Zoom, or better, Zoom Video Communications Incorporated, conflicts of jurisdiction and censorship between the physical and the virtual space are not uncommon, as one can easily find. Uh, but this is what we have for now, and what we assume that it kind of, it kind of works for what we wanted to do. It's the space given. Where in the Zoom denotes uh, not only uh, a location, it, it, it also denotes contemporaneity. We are here now. That is, if you, somebody is not watching the recording. Uh, Am I Frozen is a three minute video by students of a course who compiled all of their teachers Am I Frozen moments throughout the semester, as she uh, initially suggested. Within this space, Am I Frozen is not just a practical uh, question, it's akin to an existential one, since the shared space is not uh, persistent in the same way that we're used to. Am I Frozen together with other? Much more serious pathologies have become the existential conditions of these times, referred to usually under the blanket term of Zoom fatigue. Uh, to account for various symptoms and side effects of inhabiting such spaces, stretching from screen tiredness, even to loss of cognitive, uh, cognitive faculties, as it has been reported and investigated. With that, I want to give a shout out to all the students and teachers who have been meeting under these kind of frameworks and in interfaces uh, over the, the more for more than a year already. And let's go forward by saying like the space matters. Space, there is, space has consequences, actual and physical, uh, uh, however its materiality is. But it, it, it has a certain materiality that is worth to, uh, to investigate. So let's start by an experiment to see if things are working. Please close your eyes. It will only be for a second. Okay, now with your eyes closed, I would like to ask you to think of a balloon. Hold it there for a second. Okay, now open your eyes. Admittedly, that was not much of an experiment, but um, uh, wait, I only ask you to think of a balloon. If you're like me, visual people, uh, you think in, in similar terms with your eyes closed. When I try this myself, my balloon is usually inflated, blue or red, and is floating in the background of a rather wide abstract space. I'm certain yours was different, perhaps a different color, different background angle, perhaps a more colorful picture, perhaps not the picture at all. The interesting thing about this experiment is not that we can construct imaginary things in our heads on command. That we know, and it's also how literature works. Rather, it is that we can imagine quite different things from each other based on how we think, how we're conditioned to think, our nurture, and perhaps also our mood and circumstance. To complete this experiment, let me ask you to write down in the chat a sentence or so describing your own balloon. It is precisely in this richness of our different views that we come to understand space also as a discursive domain, as something of a difference. So if space is the answer, what do we actually mean when we talk about space? Here we are an architect, a political scientist, an artist, and a data scientist, that is to put people in boxes, uh, addressing a shared thing. How can we interface and what can we make of this occasion? The answer, I believe, lies in the acronym of the event, LASER. Evening random, which is the last two letters. Uh, before that is other science, which is a result of modern times. The answer of which uh, uh, lies in the first letter, L, that stands for Leonardo, that is Da Vinci. Uh, for our understanding, Leonardo was both an artist and a scientist. For him, probably, neither art nor science meant, uh, meant uh, made much sense, made much sense, not in the same way that it does for us now, as there were not really distinct categories at that time. In that fashion, instead of compartmentalizing the artistic, the scientific, and so, as we can very well demonstrate uh, that we can do, let's forget barriers for a moment and try to intersect knowledges and practices. 
This is one of my favorite quotes that I'll try to read maybe a bit fast. Uh, it's from geographer David Harvey. And it goes like this. Space is, is, of course, one of those words that frequently elicits modification. The complications perhaps arise more out of the modifications, which also frequently get omitted in the telling or the writing, rather than out of any inherent complexity of the notion of space itself. When, for example, we write of material, metaphorical, liminal, personal, social, or psychic space, just to uh, take a few examples, we thereby indicate a considerable diversity of context which so inflict matters as to seem to render the meaning of space itself entirely contingent upon the context. We seem to be saying that the arena of applications defines something so special about the meaning of space as to render any general consideration of its properties a hopeless task. In a few less works, uh, words, here's a, de a demonstration of exactly the same argument in a different context. This is some of the first pages from the book Species of Spaces and Other Pieces, more interesting in, in French, Espace d'Espace, uh, from 1974 from uh, Georges Perec. That shows exactly the permutations of the word space are inherently ways to frame things, to put things in a, same, in a certain container or certain framing so they can understand. Uh, the book itself, uh, it, it's a wonderful meditation of different sorts of spaces that we inhabit, different scales, and definitely very interesting reading to check, uh, especially for our times and of uh, uh, social isolation. With this complication established, established let's look uh, into formal categories of space that we inherit uh, through history and epistemology. First is absolute space, the space that most of us know and love that we're taught in school. As a trained architect, this is the mode of space that I was taught to design inside. A space that is absolute and uniform. A space that started as the first mathematics and geometry, and also was the first, at this time, the first rigorous scientific model. Unlike, for example, Egyptian geometry, Greek geometry was not applied. It was a noble form of meditation. So much that to enter Plato's academy, we to know geometry, should be geometered as in cultivated, as a modality of being. And that idea of, uh, of, of uh, geometry as the language in which God, the great geometer, great, the creator or builder, created the world in fine proportion is one that comes to us from those times. Uh, and the predicate, another predicate that we can see from Newton, Newton's uh, laws of uh, universal laws of motion is that also that idea of universality of a space that is absolute uniform, all positions are the same, with a, uh, organized around uh, the center, the origin point that distributes difference and meaning. Another flavor of space is the relational space that we got from Leibniz. Space here is composed of relations between objects with the implication that it cannot exist in the absence of matter. Space only exists when we have two or more things and we can articulate a relationship between them. In this space, it is the space of the social of flows and more practically for us perhaps of social networks today. And then we come to my personal favorite form of space is that of manifolds from Euclidean geometry that came to us from the 19th century to address certain problems with Euclidean geometry, and parallel postulate and so on. Perhaps the most counterintuitive of all, as we can see in its application in relativity theory and uh, relating also to the context, to the theme of adaptation, one way that many of us still, still struggle to reason. This, this mode, uh, at least space-time, uh, relativity theory, does away with space and time, introduces the, the interweaving in space-time. An altogether different piece that we try to understand from its paradoxes, because the space has no outside and no objective vantage, vantage point. There is no origin point uh, as with Cartesian space. All positions occupy their own reference frame, frame all differences are local. You are upside down. No, you are upside down. That was the in introduction scene from the 1960 educational film by two professors in the University of uh, Toronto addressing the same issue. So here, difference are relative, and they, then they start to be discursive. So this starts to come into effect when we zoom out away from uh, like the, 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 the macro scale, that, the, the micro scale that we live that we inhabit in our daily lives. So with that, we can think of a space, that which space we ascribe to follows completely different repercussions. Since we are space-time natives, rational space are models, at least as much as they are philosophies, philosophies of being. But also we cannot, we cannot do without space. 
the very sense of self depends on its sensory relationship to the external world. Everyone exists someplace. Conversely, sensory deprivation disconnects our inten uh, internal reference frame from the physical and the social environment and probably produces hallucinations. The experience of spacelessness does not exist as a normal state. It produces disorientation. That is from uh, soundscape studies. They were uh, looking into what happens in simulated or real deafness. And, and this, this paper by uh, Salter and Blesser shows that hearing loss can induce even mental illness or uh, paranoia or hallucination. And, uh, re uh, concluding that modern culture often undervalues the importance of the soundscape as means of sensory connection between people, between the environment, within the world. On the left is, a, is an echoic chamber, that is, this particular one is from Alto, that if people who try it at least will find it uh, at least this, discomforting. Examples of that also uh, playing with, with, uh, with this idea of, of uh, deprivation can be seen in uh, sensory deprivation chambers and among grave uh, other instances is uh, what was called white torture. So in my research, I investigate visual spaces or uh, immaterial spaces, spaces that we cannot construct in the physical world, but we can still perceive. And I do that through visual reality and through this kind of machinery as a means to explore what is possible for us to experience, experience beyond what we can come across in the literal world. This is an example that I've been working on for a few years already, which is a three-dimensional embedding of Pac-Man. That probably is, a, is an example that we all know. In Pac-Man, uh, like you, you see, the, the view is from above, it's a two-dimensional space in which the, the, the Pac-Man goes from left to right. You, 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 if you skip the boundary to the right, you appear from the left, and you generalize the idea, uh, what you get is, uh, is a torus, an embedding of the, of the same thing in the three dimensions is a torus that gives us some a geometry that is completely different from what we can experience in the physical. But this idea, to come back to the, to the story of the balloons, this idea of space is something that intrigues me. Uh, and uh, I, I come to investigate through collaborations with different uh, 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 people I work with. This is from a workshop that we did with Gerrit Sharma a few years back, that we, we gave architects blindfolds as instruments to, uh, to, to, to actually see better through their ears. Through a series of exercises, eventually we came to study a particular binaural spatial audio piece and see what is there, what can we see there through our ears. And where we came up was like super colorful things out of a waveform that we split uh, to, to make a collective VR experience that came with uh, uh, much more rich uh, spaces that one would originally assume. I started with spaces that place, and that is a reference to this film uh, by Sandra from 1974. There is one particular, um, there's one particular song from that film that I find quite interesting and very intriguing. And it, and it says, if you find that boring, just the same old, same thing, come on, sign up with Outer Spaceways Incorporated. For a black man from Alabama growing up in the 40s, that the earth is boring is just a euphemism. But Sandra was from Saturn, actually. And by shifting this frame of reference, he pioneered what was later called Afrofuturism, new ways of inhabiting uh, the world and thinking of the world. Here is another, uh, another book that uh, a short story from Ian Foster from 1909 that people, I believe, will find particularly uh, relatable in our times. It describes a world that resembles our own. Everybody is living in their own compartments and they have telecommunication networks and Skype and so on, that they don't need to go outside. And that, uh, I like, uh, I have two experts that says one, uh, the first one says, you know, we have lost the sense of space. We say that space is annihilated, but we have annihilated not space, but the sense thereof. What happens in this, in this story, and I don't want to spoil it, is that uh, uh, one of the, the, the main character goes out, managed to go out, go, to go outside of this machine. By going outside, uh, he, uh, he notices that actually the machine hums. He says, machine hums, did you know that? 
its hand penetrates our blood and maybe even guides our thoughts. Uh, and by, uh, by going outside and by removing this, this constant hump that was in the background, uh, he understands that the, like, uh, the machinery and the infrastructure of the world around them, uh, like, they can understand the, the, the weight of the machinery around them by its absence. And this was a feeling that I felt at least in the beginning of this pandemic, when things start not to work, when, you, when this harm uh, goes away, and then you understand that actually it was there in the first place. And to close, I will, I, uh, there's this quote from Olaf Orleans that says, it is necessary to unlearn space in order to embody space. It is necessary to unlearn how we see in order to see with our bodies. It's necessary to unlearn knowledge uh, of our body in three dimensions in order to recover the air dimensionality of our body. Let's dance space, let's respace our bodies, let's celebrate the felt feeling of presence. If I may add to that, collectively and together. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Konstantinos. Um, I, I feel quite inspired and you kind of take us on a journey to, to think differently about terminology, which we feel from our own understanding. So I think this is a wonderful starting point for that evening. And um, I kindly remind our audience now already to use the Q&A for any kind of questions or reactions you might have so that you can also kind of fully concentrate and dive into um, the talk of our second speaker. And with having said that, I would like to hand over to Shubangi Singh. So you can just share your screen and, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Pia. Thank you, Constantine, for that uh, very rich conversation. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm very honored to be here and uh, I'm looking forward to learning from and also to building upon the conversations that take place today. And uh, let's see what kind of knowledge we can amass after today. <laughs> so uh, my presentation would run for roughly about 14 minutes. Having grown up in Bombay, now Mumbai, public spaces back home seem like Cotadian battleground where very few emerge unscathed. With all seven shades of sexual violence on display, women who surface on the other side are often mired in bore marks, coarse crusty, skin toughened, fangs sharpened. But um, enriched in survival trips, practical survival trips for others uh, like themselves, uh, each telling the other how to survive by adapting collectively to the everyday violence. As a young girl growing into a woman's body, I had imagined building myself a body shield often, which would largely uh, comprise of a collapsible metal wire bird cage like enclosure, which when worn above my clothes would add a layer of protection from straying hands in crowded spaces where I am unable to fully protect myself, thus making my body morbidly visible and yet comically inaccessible, making a draft or two in my head often. Finding loopholes in the design would only urge me right back to the drawing board, dating it. I never intend to wear the armors that I am designing. And I hope that no one ever has to. Not only influence us, but are also affected by our contact with it. The shared landscape, far from being static as we know, is in a constant state of flux caused by agents such as ourselves who are responsible in building and reframing and breaking existing structures. So while the streets hold the possibility of being a site um, where social hegemony is exerted, 
it's expressed, reinforced, or challenged. They're equally a fertile ground for study, a space for micropolitics to emerge. They're locations where existing social hierarchies can be viewed as well as experienced, where one's body and its mobility in cities are often matters of urgent inquiry within larger contexts of how public spaces can be developed or reviewed for gendered and racial inclusivity. It does not take long for certain minorities in cities, gender and caste in India, racial and class infinite, for instance, to realize how coded public spaces really are, the position which these individuals then hold in these spaces may as well be one of being mere travelers where we're always transiting, but never staying. But this does not mean that it has to stay that way. Spaces can be influenced through sustained engagement, can be trained to include paths rethreaded. For instance, by loitering to reclaim the right to be in public spaces. The term loitering brought to India through its colonial legacy has since expanded in definition within social as well as domestic spaces. The irony of this invisibility in public spaces are matters that can be located within existing feminist actions that call for assertion and visibility of marginalized bodies in public spaces to resist existing social and gender hegemony. By the act of women occupying these spaces and visibly doing nothing. They're asserting their right to safety, to leisure, to visibility in these shared public domains. Taking a cue from activists, academics, and feminist writers, Shilpa Farke, Samira Khan, and Shilpa Ranade, where in their seminal work, Why Loiter? They write about the importance of loitering as a tool for women to reclaim public spaces. Meet to sleep, and I never ask for it. Actions undertaken by blank noise. A feminist action collective in India has rhizomatically grown over time, examining women's position in streets and subsequently within social structures of society. Over the years, pockets of women have been coming out onto the streets with the intent to address this imbalance of visibility and gender disparity in public spaces with the focus on reducing the excessive everyday violence. And they're doing this by simply being present, by loitering to reclaim the streets and thereby forcing visibility in spaces that are otherwise cordoned off to them by these invisible force fields. Meet to sleep, for instance, invites women to come to parks or any other open spaces that they may find in order to sleep, to simply nap, to rest, and to visibly do nothing. It may appear counterintuitive, but by lowering their guards and exhibiting a sense of trust in the other, they are denouncing their fear and exercising the right to safety. By occupying these spaces, the women hence are becoming a regular and uh, new visual in the parks. The politics of leisure defies social order that parametizes individuals as contributing members of society. The acceptance of women in public spaces or the lack thereof has historical distortions encased in the language of patriarchy, reiteration of power, through social order subjugation. Pakistan-based collective girls and tabas actively turn the idea of where women of decent reputation can be seen at on its head by inviting groups of women and men to places normally habituated by men alone such as roadside tea stalls. Girls at Dhabas reject the doctrine of women staying excluded from certain spaces within the city and challenge the myth of spaces being strictly confined to the possession of one gender alone. Well, while interacting with the space, uh, 
through a multitude of ways. Girls at Dhabas, Dhabas also means tea stalls, eventually hope to open the landscape for their presence in it to be viewed not as an anomaly that appears to have fallen uh, between the cracks, but rather as uh, perceived as a regular and everyday detail within this diverse social la uh, landscape. They're asserting their space and they're claiming their space in public space. And by this, it's also a simple act of subversion that is served hot on the side of dissent. But as much as loitering is an act of resistance, it is equally a way to claim leisure. I have been walking the streets in India and then here in Finland, loitering. It is where anonymity meets identity. And I'm interested in this complex petri dish of human interactions in a Hannah Arendt way of looking at publics, social and common, meaning that publics are often formed in the presence of others. I think uh, Constantinos also touched upon this earlier in his talk, which just means that um, one's understanding of self is often formed in relation, in realization and in retaliation to others. That is beyond simply adapting to stay relevant within society, beyond simply coping but rather interactions could also mean that we are training together to negotiate how we interact with spaces and come to an agreement to learn and to unlearn, to call and response. It is a constant feedback loop. It may seem odd, but several areas in the city seem to have certain coded ways of inquiring whether you belong there. This can be adjusted though, through sustained engagements and appropriating spaces to diversify the way we use it. The way that, that way we also keep spaces dynamic, activated and always a little unpredictable. Well, a quick side note actually on um, note taking, although due to its empirical uh, structure, it bears a passing resemblance to anthropological methodologies. It is in fact deeply connected to feminist practices of recording personal, political, social history as dissident aesthetics. However, the irony of how this may be slightly flipped on its head is not entirely lost on me either. Meaning there is some hidden comedy and dangers in seeing myself as this informal hobby ethnographer, making notes about a society and attempting to arrive at human behavior from limited and superficial conditions. Irony of how, say for instance, here in Finland, a brown woman observing a largely white society is making records, archiving the present, creating a timestamp of temporary interactions. However esoteric is in no doubt colored in my own cultural, in my own social, and personal experiences resulting in a flawed data set. However, it is in a small way learning how spaces are being occupied or mobilized, how they're being adapted to or tailored to fit to people around, but the responsibility of which definitely does not lie with the individual or community alone, but rather with a society that demands and structural powers and policies that must provide a broken escalator is never completely out of use. It simply becomes a stairway. I'll elaborate on this in a minute. The Poho shopping mall located in Etakeskis's, um, uh, in Helsinki's Etakeskis district, a lot of you who are present here are familiar with it, opened in 1965 and uh, was designed by architect Erki Karvinen. It was the first and for a very long time after the only shopping mall with escalators outside of the building in open air. Some escalators that have been defunct for several years now. After 1984, when New Year, the newer shopping mall, it is opened across the street, the Puho shopping mall slowly began to lose its customers. 
which as it happens so often, it's a very common trope, Puho's mall uh, slowly began to lose its customers and it fell on very hard times in 1990s. Around 2000s, however, it started to gather some interest again when immigrants started to open multicultural stores there. Now there are several stores, there are bazaars and halal butchers in Pohos, which at this point in time makes it the biggest multicultural food and grocery market center in Helsinki. This also means that many people of immigrant background, well, mostly men though, but still, to hang around the mall visibly and simply spending time with their friends and their companions. The shopping center, which is now in a drastic need for renovation, with the future of the mall uncertain since in 2022, um, all the leases will come to an end and the owner, city of Helsinki, would rather reuse the grounds to build uh, flats and are reluctant to renew any of the current uh, leases with the big and small businesses. So it remains to be seen if um, it continues to stay a home for the stores and bazaars that are there now, but could be unlikely. But if the state of the escalator has anything to tell us is that if the escalator was in a white neighborhood of the city, for instance, it perhaps would have been repaired and cared for until the end of its lease. Its steadily declining condition is a testament to how public spaces, when occupied by immigrants or minorities, would fall uh, out of grace and funding for upkeep from planning authorities. And funding is cut, therefore making it seem like occupants themselves are responsible for the neighborhood's uh, debilitating conditions. Thus further leg legitimizing evictions and higher surveillance while also keeping the white locals slightly fearful of the area and the other. Whereas um, this, this place, Pujos, right here, this, is, um, this exact homegrownness of the neighborhood would also become an opportunity or could op also become an opportunity for city to celebrate its obvious diversity as it does with the annual uh, Pujos festival, which by the way is great. And if you're in Helsinki, I would urge you to go visit. It happens in August this year soon, but it also has to go beyond this, the, the relation and the acknowledgement. A lot can be said about this, but I hope uh, this kind of explains what I see as generative coexistence, an argument for co-adaptability of common spaces and the range of potentiality that a single space could offer. A broken escalator can never completely be out of use. It simply becomes a stairway. I would uh, leave it at that. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Chubangi. That was really, I'm like, content wise overwhelming but also visually extremely beautiful and I'm already now looking forward how we can kind of enrich on the things you shared with us on the on your personal experiences but also when you expand it to like local phenomena so I think that was really really interesting but now I hand over to Frederike and you are very quick so your your presentation is already on there and I just unmute and the floor stage is yours welcome Thank you so much, uh, Pia, Konstantinos, and um, Xenia, uh, for um, putting this panel together. Um, I think it's a beautiful kaleidoscope of like different disciplinary approaches and positions and stuff like that. Um, I'm very uh, moved by uh, Chiwangi's uh, presentation just now and the image of a broken escalator turning into a uh, staircase or stairway. Um, also, the, the sense of spacelessness or the loss of sense of space that uh, Constantino just touched upon. So my mind is ringing and uh, beaming. Uh, I don't know how much uh, of that I can translate uh, coherently now into um, the end of my workday. Um, what I wanted to do today um, is to connect a couple of things that I've been thinking about basically since this pandemic and um, try to um, put it into correspondence with the theme of adaptation, but maybe with a, a you know gentle and um, still uh, thought provoking um, critique of that very term towards the end. So let's see how I can succeed 
in my own journey here. Um, I will definitely be brief um, just because we will have more time uh, for conversation that way. Um, so this is just to locate myself a little bit um, to, to say that I am a, you know, a transborder uh, individual these days uh, trying to commute between the Netherlands um, and Berlin where I've um, spent the last years. Um, I do have an interdisciplinary background and I was trying to think about what I um, you know, had to say about adaptation before I was um, putting together this presentation and I am thinking that my, my research on artists' mobilizations in cities, their contestations against the trope of the creative city and um, their claims making to, to have a seat at the table for decision making and policy making are practices of adaptation, which is trying to fit into molded spaces of institutionalized decision making and um, trying to, to adapt into already existent um, hegemonic structures. So there I found and encountered that I did seem to have done some research on adaptation, um, but I will tell you in a second why I believe um, that needs to be shifted um, slightly. So um, this is the, the roadmap for, for today, um, wanting to move from um, the terminology of infrastructure to um, infrastructuring as a verb. Then thinking about how these present times that we live in, which I call pandemic times, um, have been crucially striated by different positions of vulnerability, obviously being um, yeah, differently affected by and being differently vulnerable, um, and then moving this towards a politics of adaptation or maybe something else. The images that you see on the screen are two small essays that I put together um, last year when I unexpectedly and very abruptly had to cancel my postdoc um, research stay in Vancouver in Canada and uh, was stranded again in the provincial home of my parents where I then spent six weeks in the first lockdown, which was a very interesting experience. And um, this, um, you know, feeling out of place, feeling out of sync with a lot of things that um, were characterizing my, my um, daily routine um, led to those two small essays in the um, wonderful magazine um, Arts of the Working Class. Um, for those of you who don't know it, um, it's an online magazine, also a print magazine um, that deals with um, themes of contemporary art, philosophy, social critique, and is sold um, by houseless individuals uh, in the streets of Berlin, other European cities, and some North American cities. So I was lucky enough um, to get the chance to publish my very personal and very intimate thoughts on feeling vulnerable and seeing institutions, especially in the cultural realm, um, encountering vulnerability. So that's how uh, cultural uh, infrastructures of vulnerability, basically one and two, um, emerged. And um, yeah, the publications are um, accessible, uh, open access. So I invite everybody to to read up on it. But um, what basically um, inspired this thinking about infrastructures is seeing that institutions as these rigid and solidified entities are facing a huge crisis um, in the pandemic. Certainly it's not caused only by the pandemic, but it has um, kind of bubbled up a bit more concretely um, with museums being closed, with um, collections not being accessible, um, with theaters having to close down and all that. So I was trying to move from institutions to infrastructures. And mind you, this is uh, basically the inside of my brain from last year. So since then I have noticed that I should be moving from the term of infrastructure to infrastructuring as a verb. And I think this really beautifully um, ties into what Shibangi has shown us with very um, uh, vivid images, um, the question of the staircase, the question of the elevator. Um, so what I'm trying to get at uh, with infrastructuring as a verb, and I'm drawing a lot on uh, Matthias Kahn and his infrastructuring publics here, um, is to emphasize the relationality of infrastructuring. So how are we connected? How are we uh, human agents connected with none or more than human actors? Um, how are we connected with different types of materiality? How are we affectively connected? Um, what kind of poetics of relation or of infrastructuring do emerge? Um, how are these connections and interrelations also political? I will talk about that in a little bit. And um, how does the trope of infrastructuring as opposed to infrastructure help us to create new ways to adapt or to infrastructure politics? Um, I am finding, um, again, this um, this notion of um, infrastructuring um, from Matthias Kahn very informative um, because he emphasizes the practice-oriented lens of infrastructuring. Um, he also argues that um, infrastructuring as opposed to infrastructure uh, allows to acknowledge the inevitable interrelation of social and material agencies 
instead of um, being techno skeptical, we find new ways of understanding how we influence technology and technology influences us. I'm sure that Uz, uh, my um, fellow speaker, will uh, talk about that in more detail. And also, um, Khan argues that um, the, the lens of infrastructuring allows us to think about um, testing, experimenting, and projecting publics um, as important modes of infrastructuring. So um, we can have a cautious approach to placing normative demands um, on uh, however politics and however space uh, we conceive of. So with these, um, you know, little um, pointers towards infrastructures, I want to move um, to the notion of um, infrastructures being collectively constructed, but also deconstructed or dismantled systems that build and sustain human or more than human life. So all in all, social infrastructures are built materially lasting, um, but also um, unbuilt, um, non-material or more than material and ephemeral. And I think, again, uh, this, this corresponds very nicely with um, Shubangi's uh, a visual metaphor of the staircase and the broken elevator. Um, so after this little ride um, through infrastructuring as a verb, I want to draw attention to the trope of vulnerability, which uh, certainly uh, has existed and has been ingrained and inscribed into our bodies um, prior to the crisis. But um, it is interesting to see that a lot of um, cultural um, institutions and um, yeah, discursive hotspots um, have taken up on this um, this notion of vulnerability or uncertainty, Verletzlichkeit, Verletzbarkeit, um, and care um, in various outlets. So it seems like there is a momentum to 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 respond um, to vulnerability or the category uh, category of vulnerability as something um, that affects us all. So in that sense, is a constitutive um, dimension of um, human or more than human life. Um, and um, as I want to discuss in a little bit, um, also something very political. So again, these images um, are just like very recent, um, recently um, established um, organizations, publications, um, calls to conferences, exhibition projects. Um, if you'd like me to talk more about that, I can do that in the in the discussion. Um, but just to get from uh, Judith Butler um, the notion of vulnerability um, as an activist tool or practice. And um, yeah, the political underpinnings of vulnerability, um, borrowing that from um, Estelle Ferrarze. Um, so now I was wondering, how does my thinking of um, infrastructuring and vulnerability um, correspond with adaptation or politics of adaptation? So how, who, why, and where do we adopt? Um, and then I started realizing that I was a bit uneasy with the term adaptation because I felt like maybe I'm, you know, mischarging it wrong. Um, but I was feeling like adaptation was in a way always geared towards the status quo or towards one goal or one mode of, um, of being, one modus operandi. Um, so it felt to me a little teleological. And I was thinking, what then could I replace it with? And I was basically coming full circle with that uh, very term of infrastructuring. And then um, thinking about how through a lens of infrastructuring, we can maybe start to rethink institutions, to unbuild and rebuild institutions, or briefly, that we could infrastructure institutions into infrastructures. Um, you see some images on the um, left, I believe is yours, um, which are um, drawing from my um, latest empirical work um, in Vancouver. Like I said, um, that's what I was doing before um, Corona happened. Um, looking into um, commissioned public art pieces um, in the Vancouver Chinatown um, neighborhood. And um, I realized that there is something about politics of adaptation or politics of infrastructuring to be found uh, in these pieces. So mind you, um, you see part of the, the construction process on the top. Um, the, the final result is at the bottom. It's um, a mural um, by the Chinatown-based um, Bagua Artist Collective. Um, the mural is called Eight Immortals Crossing the Sea. Uh, it references um, an antique Chinese myth of um, eight different types of um, immortals, uh, so saint figures, um, crossing the sea. And um, the myth tells their very different stories um, of um, basically um, translocal migration. And um, in contemporary Chinatown in Vancouver, which arguably is a site of um, a lot of um, yeah, Chinese Canadian um, survival, but also of, of suffering and of woundedness um, in the face of gentrification. Uh, it was interesting that uh, a young emerging artist collective 
chose this uh, this motive. And um, what I would like to draw attention to, and which to me is um, maybe a sign or an inscription of the politics of infrastructuring, is um, the graffiti tag that says "Refugees Welcome" on the mural um, on the on the top um, um, image. Um, so we see here a sort of um, precarity or vulnerability being inscribed into the work in progress. Um, we see a claim for visibility and a claim for uh, a voice um, being inscribed into the wall that is technically reserved for something else. And I keep wondering, I cannot uh, tell you um, whether the graffiti artists knew what kind of um, migration friendly or celebratory mural role was going to come out of it afterwards. Um, but I'm using this example um, to, to show um, the sort of um, spatial and temporal vulnerability that we can find in urban space. And again, I think that's something that relates a little bit to uh, Shubangi's um, uh, presentation just before me. So what, uh, in conclusion, then maybe I'm trying to argue is that um, let's maybe think about um, adaptation in terms of infrastructuring. Um, again, um, to the organizers, I am, uh, you know, trying to um, close this as a very, um, you know, gentle, um, critique or, or um, provocation of thought um, in that sense that uh, infrastructuring might allow us to systematically and systemically um, embrace vulnerability rather than suppressing it and doing so in a non-teleological manner. Um, and in that way, I argue that um, not only the politics of space or politics of public space can arise, but also the political, which in my understanding is much broader and exceeds all these institutions and um, uh, apparatuses of power that we're immersed in, um, and to capture those in a different way. And again, uh, I'm showing um, these images of um, the different layers of the palimpsest of a piece of public art in Vancouver um, to to say that there's all these various voices and all these um, various positionalities um, in public space lingering and um, potentially visible or potentially not. So I'll end here. Um, thank you for listening, take care, and I'm looking really forward to um, the shared discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frederica. And um, I think it's wonderful that you kind of come up with questioning of adaptation and kind of looking into infrastructuring as a work from all the complexity and possibility to actually through that change in terminology also have a change in action. So I found that's, that's actually very kind of in, inspiring and I'm happy to dive into the discussion later on. But now I would like to welcome our, um, from that series, the last speaker, Us, and um, please take over the, the Zoom stage as yours and everyone who has questions or reactions just remember to to share them with us you're welcome hello everybody thank you for your time and attention in advance super happy to be here thank you for inviting me here first of all so today i'll be talking about space space trade-offs or let's say trade-offs from a perspective of adaptation um, i'm a computer scientist uh, specifically a data scientist. So trade-off is, is really a core in, in my field. Let's start. As I mentioned, I would like to approach adaptation from a, from a computer science perspective, especially I'm working in machine learning and with AI, which is pretty much about optimization. So um, just a quick primer on AI, I, I like to define it, uh, I like to remind you that whenever someone sell, tells AI, what, it, what they really mean is a computer program somebody wrote. So just to clarify. And in, in that field, in algorithmic decision-making, data-driven decision-making, uh, data science, machine learning, what we really do is basically optimization. We optimize certain metrics and certain uh, objectives. So my talk will be from, from that perspective. And the optimization perspective to adaptation is um, obviously the, the first thing is the natural definition of it, right? The adaptation in biology, um, which is evolution driven by mutations. So uh, in essence, it is actually an optimization algorithm, uh, rather, stochastic or random one but it is an optimization and of course we have adapt we see adaptation in in human made systems um it's a well-known fact that it's 
pretty difficult to make money out of stock market because when a new information comes, everybody knows that. So the market efficiency, you know, it adapts, the market adapts uh, or other kind of human made systems that as a society, we adapt to new technology, our laws have to adapt to, to, to uh, improvements in, in technology, etc. So these things can be formulated in essence from an optimization perspective. Uh, but the problem is that most interesting problems in, in real world are actually constrained optimization problems, meaning that we have physical limits. Of course, um, we can't pass the speed of light or I can't run 100 kilometers per second. Uh, I, we can't decrease the temperature of anything below zero Kelvin. These are, these, these are the constraints given by our universe, at least uh, so far as we know of it. And of course, we have resource constraints, which is quite relevant to, to, this, to today's topic that um, uh, we have limited resources, which constraints our optimization problem and adaptation problem. And of course, we have laws, which can be seen as constraints, actually. I can't do whatever the hell I want, right? Uh, and secondly, most interesting problems in the real world are multi-object optimization, meaning that we don't only try to optimize a single thing. Let's, we, we, nobody optimizes only their health in their life. Of course, you can do it, but there are other things too you want to optimize. You want to have a healthy life, but you also don't want to count calories every second and you want to have some time and peace and work and this and that. So it's, it's more complicated than minimize this or maximize this. It's, it's a multi-objective problem every day. We are doing it right now. Our biology is currently running it right now, as well as the whole humanity is running right now. And another bummer is that these objectives, these metrics we try to maximize or minimize are in clash with themselves. So they, there is a trade-off usually between these objectives. Uh, and furthermore, it's kind of difficult to actually decide and define what to optimize in real world. Um, otherwise we would probably do it. So it's pretty difficult to come up to a very uh, standard objective definition of prosperity or justice, uh, fairness and things like that. So it, it, this, this creates this higher level of, uh, let's say, challenge and, and abstraction because it's hard to adapt to things when you can't define it. It's hard to optimize things. And as I mentioned, this kind of trade-offs, there's an interesting, interesting thing in optimization or adaptation or resource planning is that resources are actually in in a self trade-off as well. I would like to give a couple of examples. I see privacy actually as a, as a resource. Um, for example, US Transportation Security Administration have a, a pre-check program where you can uh, give your data uh, in advance before a flight so that you can keep your belongings. Uh, you don't need to remove your belt or shoes. So. This, uh, this is a nice example of privacy privacy trade-off. So a government uh, higher access to your uh, personal data by the government uh, has a lower access to your body and your belongings. So there's a trade-off here. Uh, a, a second trade-off I find quite interesting is really recently from Finnish news that in Finland, uh, for, for I don't know how many years, uh, maybe someone who, who in the audience is a low, low expert, they can, they can uh, tell us. But um, if you are earning more than 100,000 euros per year, this data is public. Every year this is published and you can look at those names. Now, uh, last couple of years, especially last year, people wanted to uh, demanded that their names would be hidden um, claiming personal data law, the recent GDPR law in the EU. And just recently, I think this week, last week, uh, 
I have read on the news that the court ruled that um, the earnings data of these people will not be revealed, but the name of the people who demanded this concealing would be revealed. So this is a perfect privacy privacy trade-off. Um, somebody decided to hide from something, but now everybody knows that not only they earn more than 100,000 euros, but also we all know that these people demanded that they will be hidden for whatever reason. So uh, a privacy at this time uh, or for one year, it turned out that less privacy in the future. So the trade-off uh, appeared in the time dimension. Uh, similar trade-offs are in, in algorithmic world. In machine learning, there's fairness, fairness trade-offs. Machine learning algorithms unfortunately have lots of biases. For example, language uh, AIs have lots of gender bias. For example, chatbots, image recognition algorithms unfortunately have lots of bias detecting certain, for example, uh, races or uh, credit score giving algorithms have certain biases. And uh, there are different kinds of fairness metrics in machine learning. Uh, these we call op objectives, but actually it's mathematically impossible to simultaneously satisfy all these metrics. So when you try to make an algorithm more fair in one dimension, you make it less fair in another dimension. And these metrics, there's no the best metric. So they are in a self trade-off. Uh, th this is happening all the time, actually. And uh, my, my uh, let's say, aim in this talk is I would like to approach space also from a similar perspective. So uh, the definition of dictionary definition of space, at least the first, first one is an empty area that is available to be used. Now, I would like to highlight the phrase to be used, meaning that first it is used, it's, it's, it's a resource, um, just like other things I have mentioned, and to be used. So meaning that we have control over using it. So it's not like time, because time is spent involuntarily. I am aging right now. <laughs> and I don't have control over it to spend it. So, but space is different. Um, I can control how I spend it and I can decide to enlarge it or expand, expand it actually. So it's space as a resource uh, is obviously in clash with other resources. So um, if you want to buy a bigger house, you probably have to pay more, everything else being equal. Um, in computer science, every every computer scientist knows space-time trade-off. So you can code an algorithm that is very space efficient. So it it uh, it doesn't actually consume too much memory or space, but it's slow or vice versa. And uh, space has obviously all kinds of trade-offs with other resources, but. It also has it is in a trade off with itself. I would like you to think about this a bit. Uh, for example, enhancing pri uh, space in in certain dimension actually may result in less space in another dimension, just like the previous example I have mentioned. I think the perfect example is this Corona situation, where I know we are all sick of <laughs> talking about this, but. Uh, this is a nice example because uh, as, as humans, we, we wanted to maximize our, our space, our cities, our living spaces. So we started to invade actually wildlife. We started to invade forests, uh, Amazons, this and there, where we shouldn't be probably. Uh, and then we encountered certain pathogens, viruses, which ended us in lockdown, which is less space. So uh, space is obviously, or can be uh, in a trade-off with itself. I, would, I think this is quite interesting uh, when you think about it, because it gives, it gives a perspective that there's no free lunch. There's, there's a trade-off between resources, fair, but it can also 
a resource can have a trade-off with itself as well, which is something we, we don't think too much. Um, I would like to conclude uh, with couple of with one example we have developed in our team that, uh, for example, crowd counting with image recognition. In a standard way, if you want to count number of people in an image or any video, you can employ an object detector algorithm or a face detection algorithm, right? Uh, but now we have certain laws or certain pushback from people understandably that I don't want any face detection algorithm. So uh, there are some constraints, there are some trade-offs. How can I solve this problem? Uh, for this, we have, for example, developed, uh, developed an algorithm where we can count number of people by predicting the probability density without detecting any faces or any people. So we don't have any face detection or person detection, but just from the probability density, we can actually accurately estimate. Uh, so uh, another example is, is this deep mimic publication that uh, this is this is a data driven approach to 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 teach a robot or or an agent in, in digital world to do certain things. For example, throwing a baseball. If 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 it learns to throw the baseball correctly, hits that uh, red target, that's a good thing. And if you give some reference, reference meaning that this is how humans do it, you see how you expect, as you can see in the video about, below. But if you remove the constraint or if you remove the reference, you see it can, it can actually, it, it, it does what, what we are trying to optimize, but it, um, it's a bit, it creates or finds out awkward way of achieving it or optimizing this. So um, my last slide is this. It's a, it's a bit, maybe a big claim, but Algorithmic decision making, in my opinion, reveals these trade offs more and more simply because algorithms let us optimize things better. So we are reaching the limits. And when you are reaching to the limits, you realize, oh, it has a trade off with this other resource. Um, for example, a recommendation engine was really nice when it started, right? Uh, YouTube was giving me 10 years ago, similar videos I liked. It was nice. Spotify giving me, hey, you listen to these songs, you will probably like these songs. Netflix giving me similar, um, similar kind of uh, movies I probably would like. Or social media giving me posts that I would probably be interested in. But now we are optimizing like the hell out of it that uh, it's pretty much impossible to discover something new because I am in a bubble, we are in a bubble that the algorithms are constantly reinforcing themselves. And uh, uh, it's pretty much impossible to learn to discover something new. So we are reaching this uh, trade-off that, hey, optimizing the hell out of something, actually it blows up somewhere else. So. This is my uh, question for the discussion part that this, this slide, I would like us to think about this. Thank you very much. That was it from my side. Great, thank you so much. Oh my God, we have food for thoughts and food for discussion, I think for several days probably. So before we go into um, entering a nice discussion, I would like to propose that maybe we just take a five minute break where everyone can do whatever you feel like and we meet back um, in five minutes to half past seven finish time zone. So if that suits everyone, we can kind of get a bit like energy into our heads and then we can kind of dive into certain specifics and I, I, I try to bring things a bit like together. So see you very soon back in here. And we can already start collecting questions, by the way, right? Exactly, yes. So you can use the time for typing your questions in. Yes, please use this Q&A uh, button to put questions there so we have a list of them uh, and we can address them to the panelists. Yeah, that would be, would be really great. 
And also, if you feel that we might have missed any kind of questions or input from you, then just kind of remind us or send it again so we can kind of have it have it in the loop.
All right, great. So we are coming back a bit kind of energized and it's um, super great to see that some questions or comments are coming into the to the Q&A. So we will look into them in, in a moment, but let's kind of now after we have heard this kind of wonderful overview and I will not give a summary of the of the different talks, but I found it was actually very kind of um, beautiful to see the, the narrative of the four different speakers. I mean, like that is something which just happened to be extremely well um, kind of fitting to each other. And there are many points where one kind of can take from the other. And we looked into this terminology of space created through relationships and also the space in, in relation to scale itself. And I extremely enjoyed Chupangi's um, presentation. I feel like you invited us into a journey discussing this imbalance of invisibility and this understanding of public and how it's viewed and that it's kind of formed by the presence. And what does it mean if not everyone has the same access to kind of being presence and Friederike um, shared the observation and thought on the politics of adaptation and how the term infrastructuring can bring a new viewpoint or a kind of change of direction, how we are discussing the kind of problems nowadays. And then, of course, um, Urs kind of looked with us or explained or introduced these kind of concepts of, of AI. And I found this understanding of the trade-offs, what you addressed in the end, extremely important to be discussed and also to get away of this kind of mysterious of AI, but to understand like what is our own interaction with that and your kind of um, previous question, like how can algorithmic decisions make uh, reveals of these kind of trade-offs and what does that kind of critically mean? So there is a, a lot we can kind of look at and find a line that also we can develop maybe some new kind of, of readings out of that. So before I'm kind of talking too much, I would now also give the chance to our, to our speakers, to our guests to kind of address, or maybe you want to kind of exemplify or specify something more from your talk. So I would be very happy to kind of give you the floor before we look into our kind of questions we are having. So feel free. Um, to just unmute your mic and um, and and take over if there's something immediate you would like to add on. You have questions amongst each other, so feel free. I can start maybe. Sure. Uh, Terhi asked uh, quite quite nice question that. Uh, I think it's it's a bit directed to relevant to my my talk that uh, I was talking about um, optimizing things and algorithms help that has obvious benefits, but when you do it a bit more than more than it's needed, or if you go overboard, you hit some trade offs that you wouldn't maybe know beforehand. And I was giving an example of bubble. We are we are living in a bubble of algorithms, social media, or recommendation in genes. And Terry is asking, how how do you imagine this bubble is going to break? Uh, really? How? <laughs> now I can't I can't obviously uh, say that. Okay, this way it will break, but I can say at least some ways that I see it's possible for it to break. Uh, first of all, I would like to approach this question from a maybe philosophical perspective that um, we should we should avoid saying we know this or we know things. I think it's it's a saying I know it. I know something. It's kind of a dangerous thing because it kind of closes closes the doors, and um, it's impossible to learn something you think you actually know. So in that sense, having an open mind and accepting that there are trade-offs everywhere, uh, there's no free lunch. That's, that's start now, like first start. Uh, being aware of these trade-offs. So algorithms obviously have lots of advantages, but they can have biases 
which may blow up in some other aspect, again, a trade-off, uh, or it can actually be in a trade-off with itself, as I mentioned. So just having these awareness, of course, creates the demand that I would like this kind of products that don't go overboard, maybe, for example, Maybe I, if, if all of us or more, more people demand, uh, have this awareness, maybe we will demand a Spotify or a Netflix, another version of it, which doesn't have this aggressive recommendation and bubble or a social media, which doesn't have this aggressive optimization and adaptation, if you want to call it, uh, so that I can have some other parts of the trade-off to still to myself like privacy or um, open mind free thinking etc so uh, i think awareness is the answer to to a possibility that this can break can i can i chime in there so i think the question of bubbles and of you know the example that you you mentioned the traditional algorithms is a is a very pertinent one because we know also from poly, how politics also is um, are accelerated, are accelerated through suggestion algorithms of different uh, uh, different social networks of the age of platforms that we're living in today, right? So, yeah, I mean, you, we can discuss the problem in technical terms, like how to solve certain things. But another thing is like to also see the example of computation, of computer science, right? And many, and especially now with machine learning, many of the best examples of image recognition of this and that are like the best the best examples that we have today are open source right and everybody builds on that the problem is that the social networks that we have because they they are machines that monetize our activities and commodify and monetize our activities anyway they are kind of obscure all this so i think to break the bubble eventually we have to ask for these platforms to unobscure the algorithm so imagine, for example, if you log in into Facebook or to YouTube and you can select somewhere on the top which suggestion algorithm do you like. And in that way, and or, or if that is so open source, and so they, we, we would have some collective uh, power or governance over it because like I'm an architect, like I don't have the, the skill or the time or the, or the interest to go into, into these things. But so if suggestion algorithms are kind of somehow peer reviewed by the by the greater community uh, of, of computer science i think this would be a step to 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 a bubbleless or, or to a bubble awareness world right great point i am wondering um in what ways um the the bubble is also a result of infrastructuring, right? So that the bubble um, is only in a certain way made visible and tangible and accessible, but at the same time, it has this sort of like underbelly of other infrastructures and other modes of exchange and other modes of, of connecting that maybe need to be made more visible. So it might also be uh, just extending the politics of visibility in that. And then generally, I, I also, when you were talking, Ozu, um, was wondering, um, how is that um, logic of optimization still also vulnerable to other forces of, you know, who uh, who's in, who's out, um, who's profit, um, trade off um, on the shoulders of whom and stuff like that? The thing that I can jump in on, actually, I find this very interesting, the connections also between algorithms and my own practice of loitering because I feel like it's a very transgressive act and you do it and you don't have to depend on something to facilitate that. You are breaking the patterns by disrupting the, the, the pattern. Like if something, if you don't uh, automatically belong in the place by inserting yourself in a space, you are disrupting the pattern and kind of confusing it. So for me, uh, I often, I don't know if this is the right way to go, but on YouTube, if I feel like the algorithms are giving me uh, or showing me videos that are very similar, I just, I look up a couple of videos that are completely absurdly different to each other. And I don't know if, I, I just don't know if there's a hack that you can provide O's where you kind of, um, where we train the intelligence that determine these results for us. So you kind of create some sort of like transgressions in this by hacking the system in some way, 
by ourselves. So I wonder if there are like some sort of like tips that can adjust these biases. That's a great point, actually, loitering from a data perspective, right? And that really actually works like that. Actually, in, in, in privacy research, so there's this con concept called differential privacy that uh, researchers or computer scientists, we literally on purpose loiter the data, add some noise to, to increase the privacy, actually, of, of these databases and stuff. So it's, I think it's a great parallel you just put there. I love your idea, Shubangi, because I mean, like I'm working also myself a lot with this kind of computational design using different kind of, of modes. Um, and I found this kind of aesthetics in programming or this kind of creative part that, that you can kind of interact with the system through your own understanding of, let's say the relationships is something I'm kind of a, see a lot of potential how we can come up with totally different kind of variations and solutions. And maybe also to what you talked about also when you kind of talked about optimization, right? Um, I'm, I'm always kind of thinking, well, is it optimization or are we talking about uh, compromising? And I think there it gets in, in a way then kind of difficult. So what would we actually like to have? I mean, like we would like to kind of exploit something which is beyond, um, let's say, the kind of complexity we can envision and how can we create that through a new integration or reading or intervention of, let's say, AI and computational technology. And, and there I found there's probably a lot one can kind of combine the different things which Shubangi and also Frederica kind of points out and, and bring that into, into this way of thinking with the AI. So I'm just checking if there's any from, from the panelists or from our kind of a laser community, if you want to add on something, feel free. I'm also trying to look into the Q&A and see if there's something kind of fitting to what we're discussing right now. We can maybe also kind of um, open up into another direction. There has been a comment on this kind of um, what happens to experiences and learning if there would if there would be no need for adaptation. Does the space vanish as an experience? I, like I, I can jump in there, and I think like the, the the term of adaptation, I think to most of us was a, was a bit problematic, and I think only who's accepted adaptation, and everybody else had a, it was a bit problematic, like with the political dimension of of the term adaptation, because time is time is going, like entropy is increasing, times are not becoming simpler, and I don't like the thing that comes to mind for me is like uh, from back in the days, like what is enlightenment from Immanuel Kant. Right, and that, that was a, there was an answer of that in the elaboration of that by Foucault, and, and they were actually mentioning that in times of modernity, at the at times, uh, kind of heroic times, we are asked to live in these kind of very strange times. Like, unfortunately, or fortunately, the challenges that we are facing today are much are in different orders of magnitude. And and one thing that actually now that Pia mentioned to to mention things that we that we uh, skipped. Um, yeah, the question of the of the acronym of the laser talks and of Leonardo or art and science or whatever kind of, kind of disciplinary boxes that we have is something that is challenged today, right? With uh, uh, with what is happening in the world and and what do we identify as as the Anthropocene, which is much more than eco than an ecological disaster, is a completely kind of shift of uh, is a complete shift of the game of how how we understand the world, how how. If, I mean, the, the, the problem of understanding, like the issue of understanding was mentioned before, uh, but there's an imperative, I, I, again, to find ways to articulate forms of knowledge and practices together to address the increasing complexity of this world. So adaptation, if, they, the, if, like the, if there is a need of adaptation, I don't think that the times are getting easier as time go goes by. So at least adaptation is gonna be there in, in the form of coping, but the question is like owning our times. I know Federica right. wants to kind of um, add something on that, but I just want to add from the, from the same attendee, he kind of extended and was also kind of adding that 
hybrid adaptation of space for nature ecosystems versus space for human ecosystems slash culture. So going from the term, the kind of classical term of adaptation to hybrid adaptation, of course, opens up totally new kind of readings and interactions. Maybe, I don't know if that kind of is now interrupting your line of thoughts, Frederike, but I felt that can also go with the infrastructuring which you actually looked at. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. um, I just loved uh, Konstantinos' um, uh, term now of um, adaptation as coping, because I would say there's still a need to adapt, like there's still an urgent need to change spaces in the ways they are, because they are in a material way problematic and inaccessible and stuff like that. But what I was trying to uh, like uh, do with the infrastructuring is to take it even further, to not only, you know, dialectically try to flip hegemony into a different type of hegemony, but to, to, to uh, discover new, you know, possibilities um, uh, and different modes of being in space um, with that logic of, of infrastructuring. But still, I think um, also, um, I mean, I like that um, Shubangi was showing um, monuments and the sort of like adaptations onto these sort of like material representations of history with a capital H and time with a capital T and stuff like that. And these sort of like moldings of these material representations in space um, but there are so many different ways if we just stick with that um, you know material trope of monuments of, of uh, undoing monuments you can you know project new opinions on them you can tag them you can create soundscapes and and smellscapes around them you can tear them down so all these are like modes of adaptation um, that still need to take place because um, lots of these um, interventions I think respond to hegemonic representations of space as is, but still with the broader trajectory in mind to to go into different modes of, of being together in space. And um, I am trying to connect this also to the very first comment, um, which was the sort of like, how are we together in public space, right? About um, from Veroni, um, about sharing concrete or public space. Um, how do we do that? Um, I think um, is is a relevant question to to go beyond um thinking to incorporate new social user groups into public spaces or uh you know d doing the sort of like reformist um place making practices um but yeah with the logic of infrastructuring i was trying to again um open more territories of possibility I, um, I want to add to that because uh, now you started talking about this um, infrastructures and you said um, about this that it could be systematically embracing the vulnerability. Would you elaborate a little bit on that? That would be interesting. Um, well, I came to the realization, and maybe it shouldn't have happened only last year, that um, spaces are already vulnerable. Um, we just don't treat them like that. And I mean, spaces, public spaces like Shubangi has shown, have been, um, you know, um, zones of difficult encounter and of policing and of racial profiling um, and of hyper visibility for a long time. Um, but now um, I'm, I'm trying to think of how to integrate that into public space making also from the official point of view um, so that there is space for people to be vulnerable in public and for, for you know, the politics of public space um, to, to acknowledge that. Um, and in that sense, making more space of the broader political in public space. Don't know if that clarifies it or makes it more complex. Yeah, yeah, no, no, um, it clarifies. I was also thinking of the, the uh, Erke Alto has this last question, what Pia was already reading, where the sort of our nature and ecosystem comes in, into the uh, question. And I was somehow in my head thinking that um, because Someone, some of you mentioned about this, that we take over as human, human species, we take over the space and, you know, we take over the wildlife and so on. And I think this is maybe the new infrastructuring, what should be considered also in the urban areas is that uh, we should somehow leave maybe or think about the non-humans in the mm -hmm. urban and somehow kind of preserve, let them flourish. Mm -hmm. And I think then we all flourish. And, and that type of uh, thinking. 
Yeah, I mean, that is that is a very um, valid um, point to be added to this, you know, because um, I was in a conference all day on uh, art and um, public space and, you know, graffitis and stuff like that. And uh, Vittorio Parisi um, from uh, Nice uh, was talking about the infectious aesthetics of graffiti and weeds. Um, so how, you know, uh, graffiti as a human made uh, practice of inscription into public space um, has sort of like homological similarities with urban weeds growing um, across buildings and you know taking space and um, I think this was a, a like route maybe to go down to say it's not only us who are adapting spaces all the time there is more agents and actors um, that are doing that um, but we also need to be humble in you know letting them do their thing basically so maybe that's the yeah a bit more uh, or less anthropocentric uh, perspective to urban space and, and embracing vulnerability uh, in public space. Nitin, I would I like just to add you the possibility. Sorry, am I interrupting someone? No, Pia, please go. Sorry, Shubangi. I, I was trying to give Nitin the chance to ask his question. So please, please go ahead. Yeah, I actually wanted to pose this question both to Shubangi and to um, Auguste because I think they, they present a really nice dialectic of different views and, and uh, approaches. I love Shubangi's. Um, presentation and especially how she talked about the tactics of resistance in space that women's bodies present uh, in, in the work that she was doing in India. Some of it is obviously whimsical, some of it is artistic, uh, some of it is a design intervention, uh, but it does present new possibilities for reoccupying space. Uh, and I'm curious how we can as individuals and collectively kind of mobilize ourselves into spaces, uh, obviously mass movements and mass protests do that. And then you see a counterbalance from uh, governments who can use surveillance and repression to confront those in, in, in how space is reconfigured. But I also want us to think about how AI and new technologies present both possibilities for repression and also for civic agency in as modes of resistance in urban spaces. So I wanted to maybe present, maybe have that be unpacked both by Shubangi as an artist and also from Ogus as a scientist working in these contexts, because I think we, we can think about different ways that this, uh, this is now manifesting itself. Thank you, Nitin, uh, for the question. Maybe I can go first and then Ogus can follow maybe. Um, I, I really feel like protests that have been happening and which have been facing some sort of resistance, say whether it's Hong Kong protests or the Polish protests, and we know what is happening. We know how um, even in India, you kind of uh, become dissidents and become um, anti-nationals and are treated as one prisoners of war in some sense. And, you, and a lot of times AI and internet is used as um, mechanisms or machinations to, do, to be able to do that, like frontline workers, uh, soldiers, are you, that is what it's used as. But at the same time, I feel like it, there has to be a way to change policies that determine this taking place. And it has to work both ways, like definitely resistance in terms of mass movements cannot not happen because that, that means that democracy in any sense has died for critique to not take place. So when that is taking the mass movements in all sorts of forms, whether it is actively being present uh, as solidarity and be visible, because that is important. Like the first of May protests are happening or, or like demonstration would be happening soon. And it is important to be seen as workers who are almost always negligible in the capitalist structures, for instance. And then if you're not shown in your body and solidarity, you become individuals who are more prone to attacks and prone to uh, be uh, prone to erasure, erasures. So I feel like physical body presentations or demonstration is essential, but also it requires policies that allow critique of such sort to continue happen. So it also means that it, it just, you cannot allow being lifted and imprisoned 
So I feel like it requires policy changes, but continuing of physical resistance is as essential as it is to resist in other forms, like having internet protests, I think is equally important. I feel like the critique for armchair activists is, I, I'm not, I feel like it is as important to be or behind the computer if you cannot be in front of it and still amplify something that requires a voice or amplification. Thank you, Shubhangi. I would like to continue from that solidarity perspective uh, to this question. So how can individuals or citizens um, basically adapt to this situation with the use of technology and AI maybe because obviously it's it's a game theoretic approach, right? The government is using AI, <laughs> obviously, uh, employing say face detection algorithms, per person identification, etc. But um, citizens, we are, or or maybe protesters or uh, people who've been who've been under pressure, we are kind of trying to reverse engineer that by sharing information by actually uh, finding loopholes in these algorithms. We call it adversarial attacks in AI. You wear a hat with certain pixel print and face detection doesn't detect you anymore and these kind of things. And this comes to Konstantinos. What uh, Konstantinos said, this kind of uh, making these algorithms open source so that it's more transparent, right? It's more accessible. Uh, on the other hand, however, however, uh, if we go all the way to the extreme, I still believe in trade-offs. I, I still claim that there will be trade-offs in the in the extreme sense as well. For example, uh, I think democ democratization of AI now it's it's like a hot thing. So anyone can train their own AI models. You don't need to know actually. You can click on a couple of things and train an image recognition algorithm. Uh, but uh, in my view, democratizing something doesn't always guarantee it, it, it becoming better. Um, let's say access to gun control. If we sold guns and bullets in supermarkets, it obviously would make it more democratic. But it, I don't know if it's a good thing. And it, it might come to such a point with AI that Actually, it is already here. I can literally download a 3D print of a gun, print it in my garage, download a face recognition algorithm, put it on my drone, de or detecting certain racial groups maybe, and have a drone literally right now in eight hours or less, have a drone with a gun. I don't need to know AI. This is this is the I am a bit of course saying a bit controversial things maybe but there is also I I claim there will be trade off on the other extreme as well so this is this is my view. If I may add to if I may add to that before we go to Corey, uh, I think the the, uh, the project of that Luciano Parisi is currently working on that I think it's titled recursive colonial recursive colonialism and Cos cosmo computation comes to that that she tries to kind of understand also the aesthetics of computation and how they in we interfere with them as an alien form of intelligence and how we can use it also positively. Corey wanted to ask a question. Yeah, uh, well, thank you all for all great talks, uh, all short uh, Cambridge Dictionary's definition of space. It started with an empty place to be used. And it's amazing, actually, you know, my generation, these were the sources that we could actually learn something, you know, all these encyclopedias and all. And, but now we can actually, maybe after this talk, uh, they will probably change their differentiation and it, because space becomes like many things like resistance, interrelations, relations, optimizations. And it partly actually was just uh, answered my question, but I was wondering if, if you could think about what more political traits of we have in this space at the moment. You know, this, I always give an example of AI gun and just in eight hours that can be targeted to a particular racial group. But what else actually do you envision or vision now 
any any political trace of we have in this space. We... The okay. question is for us or for whom? No, I mean, anyone. I mean, so, uh, Shawan, so I mean. definitely is, you, know, I, I would... you, you presented a, a, a very strong political reflection. And, I was actually and maybe, thinking... yeah. Sorry, I was just thinking that I would definitely add to that what you what you ask and ask a question that's an extension, maybe in the form it also answers the question, but I would ask the question to Fred and to Constantinos specifically, because this idea of coping that Constantinos had mentioned, I, I had it written and that's exactly the kind of curiosity I have. And I think it also addresses what you're asking, Kure, because I am very interested in this distinction or, or your views on the distinction between adaptation and coping. And um, I wanted to mainly take advantage of the brains that I have in the room today uh, to understand um, specifically because in the times that we're living in, whether it is uh, uh, resistance or lack of resistance or the climatic conditions that we live in where we are always told that we are resilient as a species you know especially when there's a major calamity or a crisis that takes place we are always told uh, that we are resilient and in a way i think it is the intention is to give strength in these times um, but also to provide a sense of community in this us together narrative but I think harping on resilience, um, I feel is also somewhat implying that this is no time to fold as individuals and as communities. Um, but as a long time strategy, I wonder if it creates um, a mode of refusing to address the cracks that have appeared in society. I'm not looking at it as something that you can either respond to angrily or emotionally or critique it aggressively through protests but instead you're just supposed to accept it and call yourself and individuals as communities as resilient and what what i feel when you enter this trope is that maybe you're also forcibly in some post evolution mode of coping like you you become you you take on coping to find a sense of belonging in that narrative and the examples are plenty but I'm also just wondering of your views on this, also because, uh, Fred, you mentioned uh, vulnerability as activism. And I, I don't know if that kind of, because I am not sure if adaptability is a way forward, because I feel there's a lot of coping that takes place in this narrative, and it's not in isolation. So I was also wondering if Constantinos has an idea on that, or Fred or if you have any views on this. Do you wanna go first, Cassandios, or? Go, go. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, um, we, we didn't touch on resilience really in the talks, but I do think we all have um, these sort of like um, uneasy feelings about um, the, the, the quieting effects of that, right? To, to tell us to hang in there, but also it brings up this whole discussion of post politics of, you know, there isn't really an alternative to what we're living through now. Um, just hang in there um, and, and keep following the trodden path and stuff like that, which is in a way foreclosing other opportunities that we might be exposing ourselves to and stuff like that so i i do really acknowledge the dangers of um telling us all to cope and in a way also universalize um this condition which uh, as clearly um really isn't um the, the case so i think it's always good to remind ourselves that there is alternatives um even though they might not be presented um via you know channels of party politics and stuff like that and then that also kind of relates back to the potential of you know activisms or of um micro uh, interventions and stuff like that whether they're in the analog or in the digital realm um i was putting in the chat here the the question which literally is a hap or idea that is coming to me um of um infrastructuring activism
Buddhism, right? So I, I had that mushrooming, you know, kind of chaotic um, um, give up in the in the presentation. That's how I, I want to understand um, politics of adaptations or better politics of infrastructuring, that there is all these mushrooming things happening uh, in space and time, uh, online and offline and in between, um, that nobody then also can kind of control. And obviously that is the danger of democratization that Ozil was um, pointing to. Um, but I think that's a that's a risk worth taking to to remain in a political present, so that we're not just coping. And um, yeah, that's that's my two uh, two cents really um, to to think about um, the yeah potentials uh, maybe of infrastructuring uh, activism. Over to you, Constantinos, if you want. Yes, let me jump in there, and I think the question of coping is is a necessary one. Like uh, the last year, I mean, we have to cope. There is no, I mean, there is no other way, right? And we are all coping. There is no, yes. But somehow uh, we have to go past that. We, and, and what I said before, like we have to own our times. And I think the, the, the question there, like in this cont uh, context of adaptation and space is, and, and with all of the approaches that we presented is whatever we know about the world to kind of reassess it, to think of it, to think of it together, uh, to think of it uh, yet again, and to try to understand uh, what's going on. There was a question before in the chat about like a tag, for example, on a wall and then something else going on top of it. And I think this is the idea of a palimpsest. Things are, things are being, but things are becoming as well, which is uh, what we have not come to terms with, I, I feel, uh, in, in, within, like at least in the Western culture, in the Western philosophy of the world. And I think this is what we, what we have to theorize. Somebody asked about a practical question about uh, uh, rel uh, relativity space, I think. Um, like, I don't know, I'm not a physicist, but I think the one thing that it suggests is that there is no space and there is no time, there is space time. Things are, are a bit different. And how I see it also from the domain that I'm working, uh, I'm an architect, I'm, 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 I'm supposed to design a space, but now I, like there is another dimension that is, that is, that is appearing, that, that of time that we have to think, think uh, about, even if we're designing buildings. And maybe Korea would have the, the the other side of the things, like from from colleagues of mine that I, that work in the domain of music and especially with spatial audio, something that technology enabled recently. Then the dimension of space comes inside music, which is something altogether new. So disciplines are conver converging of uh, like how we knew things uh, until now in different domains, in the arts, in in sciences, and so on. One reading that I wanted to to uh, to suggest, and I just shared it in the chat, is from David Chandler on politics in the Anthropocene, um, that suggests three strategies, mapping, sensing, and hacking. Hacking, nothing to do with necessarily with computers, uh, but to draw from different domains and try to kind of come to terms, not come to terms, which would be uh, the coping uh, answer, but try to see like what we have now, what we have on the table. And, we, uh, and what we have on the table is artists, technologists, uh, scientists, uh, humanities, people uh, all over the world, uh, and somehow try to to see what is uh, how to go forward. Because we've seen that what we see is that we're not doing particularly well, and not doing particularly well. I, I would say in terms of, of our technologies, one of the, the most memorable videos that I've seen uh, during these pandemic times was of Boris Johnson giving a public address, I think it's still on Twitter, a public address before he got sick, probably a year ago, saying that you don't need to worry. We, here we have scientists, we have, we, have, uh, we have simulations, we have things and th this and that. Uh, we have our own sciences somehow, and we're going to manage. And I think the response to this, uh, the response to the pandemic has been to a large scale, uh, like in, on a nation scale. And I think uh, this is rather problematic. Today, I read another headline that said pharma companies uh, are trying to join forces in order to to respond to the to the demand for vaccines, and they go to, back to fighting afterwards. Maybe we shouldn't go back to fighting. Maybe the the answer is not. Maybe the answer is not game theory. Maybe the answer is uh, collaboration. Because like what I wanted to end with, but I forgot about it. Like if space is the answer, I mean anyway, whatever it is, we don't know. I mean we're all in this together. Thank you, Constantino. Um... I will kind of use this um, beautiful answer or reflection in a way to um, at least close the kind of public discussion we are we are having right now. So 
I would like really to thank everybody, like our guests, our, our laser team, and also the attendees. We know that everyone is zoomed, zoomed out and also people are later on in their own time watching it on, on YouTube. But I would like to thank everyone for joining in tonight. Thank you for the audience, for posting questions. There have been two more questions, which we were now not integrating into this kind of discussion, but which were extremely interesting. Also looking into the space as a kind of, um, in a way, traditional understanding and how this kind of um, built spaces can interact into the discussion we are having, having right now. So, but anyhow, let's kind of officially close it. And I would like to thank our, our guests. It has been a true pleasure having you with us and I'm, I'm pretty sure that we find ways how we can continue this kind of thinking discourse for through different ways of collaboration into the future. I would like to thank my um, dear colleagues like the, the laser team um, with whom we are having always great discussions about topics and different viewpoints and I would like to especially thank Xenia who has been again also in this kind of second laser talk an enormous help kind of keeping everything together reminding us sending links and bringing kind of clarity <laughs> into our approach of organizing it so this is extremely helpful and really enriching. And then of course um, I would like to thank the the whole kind of Alto team which stands behind it and, and supports us and especially to our IT specialist Temu Matilainen who has kind of supported us and has been present in Vera and making sure that we can fight all technical challenges, our communication team and of course we are thankful to Alto leadership which is supporting this kind of important sessions and also that we can continue in in the future and having said that as i was saying in the beginning we are aiming for hopefully having a physical event in september during the helsinki design week which is from the 9th till the 19th of september and we will announce that and also share the topic with everyone who is interested and we would be looking forward to see you all again and having said that i'm wishing everyone a wonderful evening and for our Finnish colleagues a very great Vappu Fest which is coming around so thank you very much thank you, thank you very much thanks bye everybody thank you so much and take care it's, thank you everyone bye.